want to give you, in 12 minutes or less, the inspiration behind a lot of my work. Why these images? Why these themes? Why these Jews? And I think it's a good question. I could blame my parents, but I'm actually mature, and I don't do that. Actually, you know what? I'm going to blame my parents. But <laughs> I'm going to credit them, let's say, OK? I could blame the pleather alone and just drop the mic and walk out of here. <laughs> but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So. In terms of the thematic content of my work, of creating a personal narrative, a lot of it came from synagogue, because my father was the rabbi. And when I was little, I used to have these fantasies while he was giving the sermon. My sister and I were trapped in the first or second row. You know, if we negotiated for a week, we could like sit in the third row, but basically we had to sit in the first or second row because we were his kids. One time during the sermon, my sister went out to use the bathroom, and he got up from, from the pulpit, the bima. He's like, where are you going? Because it was the ultimate sign of disrespect and shame for the rabbi's own kids to leave during the sermon. The idea was if he couldn't keep his own family captive, what good was he? And so we were trapped. And I retreat to this fantasy realm, having all these like, creative rushes. My mind was racing, trying to avoid the uh, words coming down from on high. And I'd be staring at the Chumash, the Hebrew English Bible. And I'd be mesmerized by this magnificent blue ribbon coming down the middle. And I started fetishizing that ribbon. And I started fantasizing that all the super friends were on one side of the ribbon. Even Aquaman swimming over the Hebrew letters. And all the super villains were on the other side. And they were having this battle royale on either side of a ribbon, all while my father was sermonizing about the imminent destruction of Israel and ways that we could extend our lives through vitamins. <laughs> I think this experience, the terrifying sermons in my ears, not being able to pee, and fantasizing superheroes having a duel to the death on top of a Bible is the subtext to a lot of my work. And that's how I grew up. Comics provided an escape from services, but they also offered a window of taking my experience and turning it into my own kind of narrative, owning it, if you will. But still, why do you want to own Jews? You know, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just let it go, do some yoga, get out of the ghetto already? And it's a good question. I wish I could. Let me explain one of the reasons why it's difficult. These are normal Americans at the age of five. This was me. Nazis killed the body, Soviets killed the soul. This is my sister, Red Pharaohs Let My People Go. <laughs> my parents got divorced around the time these photos were taken. You can see me on the lower left there. I'm already caving into an imaginary universe. By the way, I don't know who these people are, but it looks like something out of a 1970s Italian horror flick. But it's not. They're just kids who want to spend their childhoods marching in rallies. <laughs> and this is how I grew up. My father's religious, but he lived 100 miles away from us. Here he is posing with the cast of The Sopranos. And when we visit him, my sister and I would be observant. And we'd play the role of the upright, uptight children of rabbis, being molested by Disney characters. <laughs> Here we are, children of a rabbi playing doctor. And I know it looks kind of creepy and perverse, if you can see the image there. But it's actually, you can see the yarmulke? That's proof that it's totally wholesome and legit. But then we go back to my mom. And my father would be in sort of a panic to legislate the religion from afar which isn't easy if you're a rabbi, especially when the focus of so many of your sermons is the fight against assimilation and intermarriage. And he wasn't speaking in a vacuum, actually. This is Look magazine from 1964, talking about how by the year 2000, Jews in America would comprise a tiny, tiny, tiny minority, as opposed to the tiny, tiny minority we were then. <laughs> so I'd see my dad every three weeks, and I'd have this intensive Jewish communal experience. But then I'd go back to America at my mom's, but he'd still be there, a phone call away, urging me to avoid assimilation at all costs. It might make you wonder, as it's made me wonder, what would happen if Batman and Robin worked in the American Jewish community? <laughs> so Batman and Robin is a comic I did which kind of turned my personal experience into a different kind of narrative, with Batman and Robin protecting little Johnny. Are you aware that American Jews are on the verge of vanishing completely? Holy ethnic dissolution, Batman! From sitting with Gentiles in the cafeteria in school. Do you want Hitler to win, Johnny? Sit with the Jews, Johnny. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, the comic continues like that. We're not going to do the whole thing today. We've got 12 minutes. Uh, Batman was pulled, actually, out of my childhood. My sister, who, God bless her, has assimilated more thoroughly than I have. She doesn't understand any of my comics. But with this one, she was like, oh my god, that was us. We were that kid. That was our childhood. And it really was. And a lot of it came to a head when I went to high school. By the way, I'm doing my entire life story today. When they said 12 minutes, 12 hours, right? That's cool. Thank you, thank you. So I decided to go to public school, but that caused kind of a cataclysm between my father and me, because he wanted me to take the bus into Philadelphia for the only Hebrew day school in the area uh, so that I would continue my Jewish education like that. 
I held my ground, but there was a lot of tension, as there will be if your name is Eliezer. <laughs> I actually loved high school because it was my first taste of real diversity and therefore real America. But the fear was what my father would think. He wanted to know who my friends were and whether they were Jewish. In my yearbook, for instance, this was the breakdown. <laughs> and then there's me. Actually, you know what, Holly? I believe Holly was Jewish too. So, okay, two Jews, you see that? And I know it sounds ridiculous to be counting Jews to even care, but that's how I felt when my father would ask ever so nonchalantly what people's last names were, what their mother's maiden names were, what town in Poland their grandparents came from. It made me feel like I was hiding, not so much from my classmates, but from my father, lest he know that I was assimilating. I felt just like Anne Frank. No, I didn't. Easy, easy. But the Holocaust is relevant because the reason for my father's panic was the concern and fear that the Jews were dying out. And we needed to recreate what the Nazis had destroyed. I remember learning at a young age, too young of an age to be learning these things, that all my sperm was precious because it contained enough cells to replenish all the lives lost in the Holocaust. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know if it was per ejaculation, per week of masturbation or what, but you can imagine the pressure this put on me. <laughs> Not to mention the ways I started thinking about sex. And this adolescence, when I was discovering women, and when I say discovering women, I mean masturbating to Betty and Veronica. <laughs> but that's how it all comes back to comics, because sex, death, and comics are the Jewish trinity. But that synthesis has always interested me, the popular, the sacred, and the profane, and the personal sifted through the communal and the global. And that's the kind of comics that interests me, whether it's Luke Skywalker, who prefers to sleep with his sister than with a Gentile, <laughs> or a liberal who turns right-wing batshit insane on the solitary issue of Israel. But I should emphasize, it wasn't just this tortuous, thorny stuff. My father was fun, too. You can see that in this letter he wrote me in summer camp. He wrote on a torn piece of paper taking on the persona of supervillain. I am holding your father hostage, he wrote. He is my prisoner. I torture him sometimes, but in general, his health is okay. I will release him on one condition, that you turn over all your comic books to me. So that's funny and creative. You can see how that would be a source of you know, inspiration, right? But on the other hand, it involved my father being kidnapped by outside forces, <laughs> Gentiles, no doubt, and asking me to save him through my comics. Had no effect on me at all. All right, now let's talk about my mom. Public psychotherapy, it's fine. I never really understood or experienced the Jewish mother stereotype, because my mother is nothing like it. In fact, if my father is both reverent and controlling, my mom was sort of the opposite. Visiting my father, these are the books I would see. Sermons for the 70s. Sermons of the year round. <laughs> Best Jewish sermons of 5719 to 5720. A personal favorite. <laughs> Best Jewish sermons of 5725 to 5726. Not such a good year. And then, coming back to my mom's, these are the kinds of books I would see. The Joy of Sex. And not on a high shelf either, Mom. <laughs> or The Collected Letters of Van Gogh. My father would give me gifts like this. And my mom would give me gifts like this, which is a dildo, apparently, from a trip to Jamaica. And if there's kids here, I'm sorry, sex toys. But whatever. <laughs> she actually went there with her African-American boyfriend, whom she met in jail as his caseworker. And, no, it's actually a long story, a sweet story, or maybe semi-sweet, bittersweet, I guess. Um, but I feel like it gives me all kinds of multi-ethnic edge, and I wanted to bring a picture of that to show you, because as you, if you look around, you can see it's such a multi-ethnic environment today. <laughs> and I figured, you know, you'll be really impressed and everything. But unfortunately, it was, a, it was an acrimonious breakup, and she destroyed all the photos. So I was going through, like, Vibe, XXL, The Source, looking for pictures of Lil Wayne or Kanye West to, like, Photoshop in with my mom. But I figured that's disingenuous, you know, and you like truth here. Uh, so I figured I'm gonna, I got her to say it into a tape recorder. I'm Ellie's mother. I had a black boyfriend when he was growing up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Y'all feel that? All right, back to the family tree. This is my dad standing Dirty Harry style in front of his synagogue defaced by a swastika. And this is my mom after feeding us peyote, teaching us kumbaya. But my mom was not always like that. In fact, when they were married, they were both balei tshuva, which is a Hebrew term. It's hard to translate. Rough, loosely translated means borderline psychotic. <laughs> Here she is in the synagogue sisterhood brunch on the lower left there, the Rebbitzin in the newspaper. But the difference is my dad stayed with it and my mom didn't, partly because being a rabbi's wife was too constraining. And of course the irony or paradox is that the obsession with continuity actually kind of destroyed the marriage. But whatever, I'm over it. I don't pity myself. I don't Photoshop my parents into old magazines because that would be a sign of mental illness. <laughs> 
Anyway, when my mom left, she left it all and apparently became a government spy. <laughs> and after the divorce, they went their separate ways. My dad continued his religious life. Here he is organizing services on the Long Island Railroad. No, no joke, actually. And my mom became a social worker working with underprivileged kids in Albany. And that's how she met her boyfriend. She was his caseworker in jail. It's a very sweet story, actually. So in some ways, I was caught between the two with these very different backgrounds competing for my attention and, if you don't mind the melodrama, my soul. You can see my mom was really excited to be at this family reunion. But ultimately, if I have to choose between going to services on the Long Island Railroad and hanging out with black kids in Albany, I prefer hanging out with black kids in Albany. And yet, this is something that the ardent defenders of the faith do not understand. It is still my culture, and I'm still fascinated by it and fixated on it. It is a great reservoir of narrative and artistic inspiration, and I refuse to let it be defined by the schmucks. And I should add that it's not just that my mom stopped being religiously observant. She also brought me up with a certain unique perspective. You can see that in the letter she wrote me in summer camp, the same year that bar mitzvah photo was taken. This is how she ended it. The 4th of July is approaching, a time when we must remember the struggles that our forefathers endured to establish on this continent a nation independent of the Queen and King of England, which land was to subsequently become a far greater threat to and violator of human rights, both here and abroad, than the parental England ever was. However, we must perform our patriotic role and light a sparkler. My son, I know you will carry on the family tradition and fart on the flag. All my love, Mommy. Thank you, Mommy. So it should be clear how indebted I am to her. But anyway, if I am fascinated by and fixated on this Jewish stuff, the question becomes, am I going to go my father's route and draw it as adorable kittens singing the Israeli national anthem? Or am I going to go my mother's route and draw it as violent chimpanzees warring for tribal territory? Or to put it another way, this, how much is your father worth? Or this, fart on the flag. But to be honest, isn't that a false dichotomy? The truth is both are my narrative, both are my culture, both are my experience. They are my tradition, my history, and although the term is overused and sometimes ambiguous and meaningless, my identity. They both inform my work. Why is that? Because transformations and reinterpretations of personal and collective experience is the cornerstone to the creation of art. Thank you. <laughs>